Dave Burkett here along with Carlos Menares. And Carlos, we have a new regime for the Lions. It's official or just about official at least. Uh, Brad Holmes was introduced on Tuesday as the new Lions general manager. Dan Campbell has agreed to terms at the very least to be the Lions next head coach here on Wednesday when we are shooting this and he'll be introduced here in the next, I don't know, 24, 48 hours, sometime here in the next few days. And uh, look, a uh, lot, to, lot to digest, a lot to discuss. We've talked about this a little bit, but let's just get it on record. Um, how do you feel about the new regime? What do you think of these hires, this, this new tandem uh, that's going to lead this organization going forward? Well, Dave, you know, uh, I think this is when everybody was upset with Matt Patricia and Bob Quinn, clearly they were thinking um, Brad Holmes and Dan Campbell are the saviors. These are the people that the Lions need to move them forward, to have 10 years of uninterrupted winning Super Bowl after Super Bowl. This is the obvious choice, right? So uh, nobody saw this coming. Nobody saw this coming. No, no, hey, not nobody. I did have Dan Campbell on my uh, my head coach candidate list. I just That's true. He was number thirty five or thirty six on the list. I think it was. Yeah, six something. Um, but go ahead. Your point is taken. You're right. Well, they were a little off the radar. They weren't the sexiest choices, but I do think they, you know, at least from what the Lions, the criteria they laid out, they seem to fit some of that. Well, let me ask you this: How many interviews did Dan Campbell have uh, for head coach jobs? This year, uh, the Lions were the only one. Okay, so so uh, Brad Holmes interviewed with the Falcons and Lions and Dan Campbell. So, and probably only the Falcons because he happened to stop by on the way home from the Quickie Mart to get some food or something. So, uh, he lives in Atlanta. Um, so this is this is my big concern: is nobody else seems to want these guys. So either the Lions have a monopoly on wisdom and outfoxed everybody, which is total Lions, right? This is what the Lions do all the time. Um, or they're really, really, really thinking outside the box on this. Now, you're right. They check boxes. They, they, uh, these guys don't come off as inept or anything. They, they seem to fit the mold of what they want. Um, you know, there's going to be – Campbell has experience. Uh, Holmes has, is a smart guy who knows how to use now analytics and evaluate. So maybe they will work together well that way. They'll complement each other. This just doesn't scream obvious – greatness from the start to me well matt patricia was the obvious choice last time around and that one certainly yeah. certainly didn't work out so i don't know that you know i would i would judge it on obvious listen i you know carlos we, we carlos and i talked about this yesterday for everyone out there a little bit and i you know I've, I've said this publicly before right like there are some concerns with the hires i mean brad holmes is a young guy he's never i know he was in the building early in his career right but he was he's never run a building he's never he's never done some of those things you know the organizational structure really i guess i you know, I wonder how much the Lions fell into this versus wanted this to happen based on, you know, the people that were taking part in the interview search and, and are now in roles of power. I mean, Mike Disner wasn't going to hire someone who was going to be the GM and run the entire building now that he has a share of it, you know. So I think there are some legitimate concerns there. You know, Dan Campbell, he doesn't, you know, he's not Kyle Shanahan or Sean McVay, someone who's going to come in with this this great X and O knowledge, Andy Reid, right, who's going to call plays. So I think it's fair to have some questions about it, but look at the end of the day, you know, I think, uh, you know, the lions with Brad Holmes, they went with a guy that does, you know, has earned a lot of respect across the league and the feedback that I've gotten from people associated with him, working with him that have no ties to him. A lot of people think he's a very bright guy and, and, you know, uh, can be a good general manager because of some of the ways that he operates and some of the, the, the eye for talent that he has. And, and Dan Campbell, you know, uh, I guess the, the biggest quality in Carlos, you know, is just that, that leadership of men sort of thing, right? Like we've talked about it before. I know it's sort of cliche, but this is what the lions wanted. It's no surprise, I guess, that, that Chris Spielman leading this search led them down that direction. You know, he certainly checks off that box in a major way. When you talk to people that have played with him or played for him, um, he's going to have to have a good staff. I mean, that's going to have to be a big thing if the Lions are going to succeed, right? Is that they're going to need a really good offensive play caller in today's NFL. So I'll, I'll be in, uh, interested to see what happens with that hire. But, you know, I I think I'm not writing this thing off as, ah, these are, this is the Lions making another silly decision. I'm certainly not saying they've hit home runs with both these hires, but uh, I do, you know, think that the process that led them here, the, the, uh, boxes that they wanted checked off. These guys both fit those bills in the respective positions. And for that reason, you know, maybe they have a chance to have some success. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's possible. You know, the, 
I, so do you think that, I mean, my, my, my no. feeling on hiring a head coach um, oh, we lost you there is that you do want someone like, a, oh, sorry. Um, my, my feeling on the head coach is you do tend to want to have someone like an Andy Reid or, or, uh, you know, a, a you know, Sean McVay, uh, uh, Sean Payton, Bill Belichick, guys who really have a strong control over one part of the, the team, offense, defense, whatever it is, um, or a very great, great holistic vision if you're like Belichick. But but is he more, I mean, he, he seems he's going to be more like a Mike Vrabel kind of guy, like, a, you know, I'm the, I'm the leader, I'm the rah-rah guy, I'm going to rally people, but I'm not going to have – you know, I mean, Jim Caldwell actually was kind of like this, right? Um, Absolutely. My, my concern about that is this is what happens with Jim Caldwell. When you hire a Jim Caldwell type or even a Mike Vrabel type sometimes, you, you can get a Joe Lombardi out of it too. You know, you don't even, – even Patricia, right? He, had, he held on to Cooter, had to get rid of him. He had Pascaloni, and he had to get rid of him. So the coordinator sometimes can be sort of a musical chair thing. But, you know, if you don't have a strong sense of – I'm in control of one side of the team or, or the other, then you're hiring you, your lieutenants and you're not going to be, you know, um, there's going to be some risk there probably. Um, Aaron Glenn, we're hearing he's going to be the, the DB coach for the Saints is going to be the coordinator. He'd be a first time coordinator, you know? So there's all these firsts, I think. And that's, that's the, the big concern. There's a lot of balls in the air with that of first time untested, um, sometimes it works and more often than not, it doesn't work. Um, right. so that's, that's my big concern. They're going into this with a lot of unknowns, a lot of unproven people. Maybe they have up, you know, potential, like, what do they say? What uh, it's always that backhanded compliment in football, right. With a, with a young player is he's got a high ceiling. That means he's not very good right now. That's really what it means. We hope he'll get better. Um, but he's got a high ceiling, you know, cheese Tabor, I think had a high ceiling. So, you know, that's got a low ceiling. Jeff Okuda has high ceiling. So maybe they are good. Maybe they are first round picks, but they're, but you're right that there is a lot, there's a long way to go to hit their potential. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, they're not, no one's going to know. And after, I mean, my only thing was, you know, I wanted the GMs that, you know, Colbert and Schneider after that, I don't think there was, I don't think there was a home run higher in this coaching cycle. Actually, I, I, I didn't feel that um, who knows, but I, I just didn't feel it this way out. So I don't know if Campbell is really going to make that much of a difference. Um, you know, the sexy hire would have been a college coach, right? A Matt Campbell or, a, you know, or a Pat Fitzgerald or someone like that. But that would have, like you said, th this is the whole thing with the lions and there's this whole organizational labyrinth that's going on. And, there, and every time you fire people, it shakes, it shakes up the organization. You have a Mike Disner. You have a Chris Spielman now. You added another layer to that administration that wasn't there before. So there's a lot of sometimes I'm, you know, I'm just going to say jockeying for power. You know, it's not exactly, I'm not saying people are slashing each other's throats over there, but, you know, like this is an opportunity. Things are being changed. And Mike Disner took some of the football administration duties away from Brad Holmes. You know, I mean, uh, uh, Rod Wood painted it like he's he's doing him a favor. That's just garbage stuff. He's just taking the garbage out for him. Like, no, this is power. This is a little bit of a power grab. He's going to, you know, anytime you have more, the more things you're in charge of, the more power you have if you execute them well. So who knows if Disner's in line to potentially become the president, if that's going to be Spielman down the line. Spiel, Rod Wood said yesterday, Spielman's going to have some, a lot, he's going to, Spielman's going to have his fingers in a lot of pies. It, what Rod Wood said. So that's kind of an unknown right now as well from, from our standpoint. So, so yeah, look, I, I think, you know, obviously you want to surround yourself with, with, with bright people, right. In any walk of life, you know, I, it's like, I always tell my kids, right. If you're the smartest person in your room, you're in the wrong room. Right. I mean, I'm not the one who coined that phrase, but you know, I, I think it applies. Right. And I think that's the case for the Lions, right. They, they, they think highly of Mike Disner. So they want him involved. They think highly of Brad Holmes. So they want him involved. You know, they think highly of Dan Campbell and look, Dan is not just, you know, as much as he's, this is about leadership and that those sort of things, you know, talking to some players that played for him, they say the guy's a really good teacher. Like 
Jake Stoneburner told me best tight ends coach I ever had. You know, if I had him in like in college, like I, I can only imagine how good of a player I would be because of the things that he taught me from having played the position and the little tricks he knows. So I, you know, there's, there's more to Dan than just being, you know, the, the gruff guy that's going to get out there and, and fire you up. But that's the, the big part of why they hired him. But Carlos, I think your point about, you know, um, Hey, look, everyone makes the, the Mike Vrabel comparison, right? I've made it myself. You know, I talked to Dominic Raiola yesterday. He made the, the Mike Vrabel comparison just off the cuff. That's the first person he thought of. But I think your comparison to Caldwell is apt too, because Caldwell was a leader, a different sort of leader than Dan, but he was a leader that people in the locker room wanted to follow. And I think the thing that, you know, Caldwell's problem in Detroit, in my estimation, I mean, some of it might have been, you know, coordinators, at least early on, they didn't maybe have the right guys or assistant coaches, let's say, let's throw Ron Prince in the mix there, you know, and I think TA did a good job on defense, Terrell Austin. Um, but, but it was just, you know, that ceiling, right? Like, what was going to be the ultimate ceiling for them? Could they get past that nine, nine and seven mark, 10 and six? And I know they did the one year, but I, I just mean it consistently. And I didn't know that they could maybe because, you know, again, when you're right, when you look at some of these other teams, you know, Andy Reid, you know, one of the best play callers in the game, right? Sean McVay, you know, just a really bright young coach that seems that Kyle Shanahan, same thing, Belichick, as you mentioned. And so if you don't have those people, you know, as your, your lead dog, they can get plucked away very easily. And so I'm not saying, you know, that, 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 that Dan's going to be in any trouble there or anything. I just, I, I think you're, you're right that that is one of the concerns that you can have about the direction of this regime or, or the, the fact that they went down this road of hiring a coach rather than trying to find, you know, the next Kyle Shanahan, right. And identifying a Brandon Staley, if they, they thought he was some Bill Belichick in waiting or uh, uh, an Arthur Smith, you know, who, who went to Atlanta, if they, they think he's the next wave of offensive genius. So I, it's fair to have these concerns, but again, I, you know, I think, um, you know, this is, it's a, it's a, a regime, I guess, that, that has that upside that you mentioned that may be worth betting on from, from that side of it. So, you know, as we spin it forward a little bit, Carlos, I, I guess I want to know, what do they need to do? What are their first one or two orders of business to get this thing right? What do they have to have go well for them here in the next, you know, six to 12 months to get this thing on the track that everyone wants to see it on? So rather than talking about another coaching search in three years, we're talking about contending for an NFC championship? Um, let me just answer one little, say, go back just for a second, just to be fair for them, to the Lions. They did kind of try to get the genius by getting Patricia, you know, a guy who had command of one side of the ball, had a great reputation. He was going to be one of these, you know, the problem is they were, they kind of went around about it the wrong way by getting Bob Quinn and just trying to redo the Patriots. But that, that was their thought. And I think, obviously this is the opposite is we're not going to try to get the genius. We're going to try to get the, the coal. We're going back to, it's just, it's just, you know, call yeah. leader of men, Patricia sure. genius leader of men. They're going to go for the genius next time. So Matt, they, Campbell, they, didn't, they haven't gone the offensive genius route though. And in today's NFL, you know, I think sure. that's where a lot of, a lot of, you know, organizations have gone and it doesn't always work. I mean, look, since it <laughs> wasn't great this year and they went with a young guy that hoping to strike gold, but you know, right. LaFleur and Green Bay is a pretty smart mind and Shanahan, you know, you think about the, the teams that have been in the NFC championship the last few years. That's right. right. So, so you're saying Jim Harbaugh in three years is what you're saying. Offensive. <laughs> I'm saying there's uh, like, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe Joe Brady has a younger brother or something like that, that no one knows of yet that all of a sudden you come around and, you know, some teams yeah. can pluck that. There's, there's Greg, Peter, and Bobby. So, yeah, one of those guys. <laughs> Marsha. Oh, okay. So, you're, I'm sorry. So, your question was, how do how did they – What comes next? Yeah, what do they have to do mm -hmm. now to be successful? I mean, you know, they're here. So, let's – instead of analyzing it, let's let's spin it forward. What do they have to do to be successful? Um, You know, the number one thing is stop lying. Stop. Let's just, let's just accept it. It's a rebuild. It's not a retool. Brad Holmes refused, refused to call it a rebuild – They've got five draft picks. Um, there's too many problems. There's too many holes on this roster. You're, you're not gonna, you're not gonna come in and here and you know fix it right away. You're not gonna. This team is not a few players away from, from being from winning 12 games and making the playoffs. And you know, of course, I just said that and they're gonna do it. But um, they're they're not that close, right? There's a lot of issues um, with this team. So I think they've got to they've got to come up with at least a two-year plan, maybe a three-year plan for 
where do we want to be in three years and how do we get there? Um, because at that point, Stafford's contract is out, is over. So there are certainties built into that three-year plan. Um, you know, Kenny Galladay will be now close to 30, I think, in three years and that kind of stuff. Like, what, what is our plan going to be? Because this year, we're not going to be very good. They're just not. There's just no way. There's there's too many issues. Um, so come up with your plan of, you know, what, what kind of defense, what kind of offense do you want to run? Are you going to stick with Stafford? Um, uh, you know, what are you going to do with those five draft picks? Is, is keeping Stafford more valuable to you than dealing him and getting some more draft picks? Like that, that's where, that's where I don't know. I don't know where they have to have that vision of who do they want to be. If they want to roll with Stafford, that changes things. Um, so I don't know. There, there, there's just, there's just too much work to be done. Um, frankly, on both sides of the ball, especially defense. Um, and the same thing, Brad Holmes yesterday said, you know, calling it a retool of the defense, like, come on, this defense, you need to blow up. I, I mean, just keep Jeff Okuda and Trey flowers and get rid of everybody else. That's it. Just start over those two guys. That's it. You know, um, there's nobody else worth keeping. So Romeo, what do you think? I mean, what do you think? What What are they? Are they going to win this year, Dave? Or, you know, are uh, you I mean, look, you know, it, they are. They're, it's going to be tough. It's going to be a tall task because that defense needs so much work. And you're right. The resources that they have available this offseason. Um, you know, I, I don't know that, you know, that it's it's you know, that they're going to have enough to, to significantly impact that side of the ball to make them what they need to be on that side to be a legitimate contender. Now, offensively, I think we all agree, right? There are some pieces there. And especially you can bring Galladay back on the franchise tag and you've got him, you've got a, you know, a, a, a young back with upside to use the word we talked about earlier and DeAndre Swift, you know, Stafford, who's, you know, let's face it, Stafford is better than a lot of quarterbacks in the NFL. So I think you can win with them. The question is how big you can win with them, right? But I do think Stafford will be here just reading between the lines and what Brad Holmes said yesterday. Um, so, you know, it's it's a rebuild. I agree with you, Carlos. Uh, but, you know, they're they're not going to tear it down to the studs, I guess, is, is his point, you know. And, uh, you know, I, I've been pretty clear about this, that, you know, I think they need to start planning for the future because if you don't tear it down to the studs, then – Next thing you know, these things like Stafford's contract and injuries and Galladay's contract and, you know, all these things do catch up with you in the, uh, the, the near term. So they both have a lot of work to be done. Um, the one thing that Brad Holmes said yesterday, too, that, that I think stood with me was, you know, he mentioned, uh, you know, early on in, in I think it was, I forget, it was Les Snead, Sean McVay. I don't, I don't remember exactly when they signed it, but he was talking about signing guys like Andrew Wentworth. And I think it was the beginning of Sean McVay's tenure some guys that maybe weren't the sexiest free agents, but that they saw as being, um, you know, fits for them, good players, but, you know, fits for them more than just making the biggest splash. And so I sort of see that as what they're going to do with this off season, right? Like they're going to get their, right. When Jim Schwartz was here, how they went out and they got Nate Burleson and Kyle Vandenbosch, right. Some, some good players, not great players, but good players. That's what I think the Lions will do this off season, right. They're going to get those cornerstone players. And then 2022 is where they, sort of gear up for that run so uh, will they be better this year I, th I think they have to be <laughs> you know in 2021 but I, I don't know that anyone should be expecting grand things uh in terms of competing for Super Bowls next fall you know that that that, that whole thing with Whitworth and whatever everybody does that you know I mean Patricia got Deron Harmon and and they got you know Desmond Trufant and you know I mean like everybody's going to add their their free agents that they can get you know Vitae you know guys that they can they need to plug holes. They need veterans. They need guys who, you know, and sometimes they don't work out. Sometimes they do. Um, you know, so I, I, I don't know if I really, you know, you're, you're going to miss as much as you hit. Um, now the question is a whole, the, the question with Holmes that we're going to see, as we saw with, you know, with Patriot, with uh, Bob Quinn and Patrick, you know, is it going to be the Rams way, you know, or is it going to be more of the saints way, you know, the Ram standard because Holmes is adamant or he has been adamant in the past of all these little boxes that he wants to check about passionate player and, and doing things the right way. And he has his own, you know, criteria. What is Campbell's criteria? We're not quite sure of what kind of player he likes of, you know, the tough, you know, kind of SOB guy who's willing to get a little dirty and, and get, you know, and, and play tough. Or is he also the guy who wants the, I want passion and I want to, you know, him to do it right and fit within the culture and all these other things. So how well, the, 
how those are visions are going to mesh is the question. Yeah, no, I, and that's a fair question because obviously they haven't worked together before, but I do think what the Lions were doing in this process was, you know, you know, they had their checklist, right? They're, you know, you, you check off the keywords, right? It's like, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, Google or whatever, when you're looking through resumes, right? All these recruiters are right now, this word checks off and this word and this word and this word. And so those are the people that you end up interviewing when you're sorting through, you know, a thousand different resumes that come in on indeed.com or whatever, you know, some of these, these places. Well, that's what the Lions had when they're interviewing people, they have this checklist. And so Dan Campbell checks off the same boxes that Brad Holmes checks off. And so I do think there will be a lot of crossover. I mean, these guys have to learn to work together and there will be a feeling out period. And as with any relationship, you know, you, you know, you'll go through your tough times or have your disagreements, but I, I do think they're, their visions at least would would align in that regard, even if they are, you know, come from different trees and, and have, you know, maybe different ways about uh, of going about things. I mean, you know, one thing the Lions liked about Bright Holmes was coming from the Rams where the Rams are sort of seen as, uh, you know, a front runner with some of their, their scouting practices, I guess, and the way that they, you know, coordinate their board and incorporate analytics. And so, you know, the Lions want to try to get ahead of that curve for the first time in forever. And I think that's part of where Brad comes in and, you know, they, they believe in Dan and they believe in, you know, what he's, what he can sell to a, a locker room. And so again, we'll, we'll see, you know, how that works out, but I think it's important that right off the bat, they obviously need to, to, uh, you know, Brad Holmes needs to nail the draft. Maybe that involves trading down from seven to getting more picks because you're right at, you know, with five picks in the draft, you just don't have enough ammunition right now. And, and, I still think figuring out the quarterback position long-term is key for this franchise going forward. And uh, are you giving us a hint that you're looking for a job since you brought up resumes and indeed doc? I mean, I know, I know the hall of fame voting and discussion and stuff always makes you want to quit journalism outright. So um, are, are you, is it, PT? are you shocked? What's going on? Are you getting a new job? What's yeah, well, uh, you know, I'm planning to win the billion dollar mega ball or whatever it is, power, power ball. I don't know, whatever. It's been a long time since I bought a lotto ticket, but you know, I'm, I am going to go out and buy, spend $2 on a lotto ticket. And so when I win that, yeah, I'll be, I will go into, you know, uh, use sports coaching full-time for my kids. That's just, I mean, I'm, I, I won't need to fill out a resume and put it in on indeed.com. I hope so. I will, uh, I'll be like Arthur Smith and I'll have, you know, enough money to donate to get myself my foot in the door. So not that Arthur Smith did it. I'm just saying, right. His, his first job was with, was with Washington. His dad was a part owner of Washington's first job in the NFL. So I was just making a joke there, but, um, but anyway, you know, he, he's a really good coach. And uh, you know, that, that's my, you guys know that already. That's my, you know, when I, re, if I, if I, if I instantly became wealthy, yeah, you probably wouldn't see me on here anymore. And I just got, <laughs> All right, but you're staying with us. The the Hall of Fame didn't uh, didn't scare you away. All right, so let's end it on that, I guess. Right, uh, you know, Kelvin Johnson Hall of Fame um, vote was yesterday. It was Tuesday. I spent a good nine hours sitting in a, a Zoom meeting, longest Zoom of my life. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, it, you know, there's only so many things that we can say about the discussion publicly, right? We're not supposed to to say who says what in the room, but. I can tell you this about the Calvin presentation. You know, it was, it was one of the longer discussions after my presentation that we had. I think there was a very um, thorough, it wasn't heated, but it was, a, it was a very, you know, thorough discussion on the merits of first year eligible players. You know, there, there certainly are, are voters out there who, um, and, you know, more than one uh, who, you know, think that the Hall of Fame has gotten in too many first time voters. They, I don't know, they, they, put this, you know, special thing on, well, first time voter, they shouldn't get, or first time eligible, they shouldn't get in. And I always say, put the best five in, right? The most five, you know, deserving players. And to me, Kelvin Johnson was one of the, those five. I mean, he, you know, I think obviously, you know, Peyton Manning uh, was, is going to get in, you know, and no one can argue that. And just about everyone would say, uh, you know, Charles Woodson belongs in. And to me, Kelvin was third on that list. There are some other good worthy candidates, you know, Tony Baselli, Richard Seymour, John Lynch, but Kelvin Johnson as a talent, as a player, um, just everything that he did, he, he elevated himself. He was above the, the rest of that group. So to me, Kelvin Johnson should be in uh, this fall in August when, uh, when the Hall of Fame enshrines both the 2020 and the 2021 class. And there wasn't any other 
re, was there any other receiver out there, Reggie Wayne or someone like that, who's like there? Uh, there seemed to be like, oh, this guy's close. It's like Calvin one, and this Wayne's one A or someone or Calvin's clearly. Yeah. Above. Yeah, statistically, I mean, look, the other receivers in the room that we talked about were Torrey Holt and Reggie Wayne. And if you're talking bottom line statistics, you know, Torrey Holt and Reggie Wayne both have better numbers for their career than Kelvin. They both played longer. And, you know, Torrey, for for the first nine years of his career, Kelvin played nine. You know, his numbers were, were comparable to Kelvin's. There's no doubt about that. Um, you know, Carlos, I, I, uh, I don't think either one was quite in the caliber of Kelvin as a talent or as a player in the way teams defended them. And Let's see, I, I might have something here because, oh yeah, all right. So I, I shared, you know, I, I shared this, I shared these numbers, the videos up on, on the Pro Football Hall of Fame's website, part of my presentation. Kelvin Johnson, right? He played nine seasons. No one can argue, really good player, right? The, the lack of help that he had. And I think, you know, a lot of coaches that I talked to uh, through this process of presenting Kelvin, um, one thing that they pointed to was that you don't know what we had to do to change our defense around to, to account for Kelvin and the things that he was still able to do, the, the numbers that he was still able to put up, even though every single game, we focused all of our resources on stopping him because the Lions had no one else. Kelvin Johnson, nine seasons. He had one 1,000 yard running back, Reggie Bush, one 1,000 yard receiver teammate in Golden Tate and his quarterback, Matthew Stafford, uh, one Pro Bowl selection as an alternate, right? The other wide receivers out there, Torrey Holt, eight 1,000 yard rushers in his 11 seasons, seven 1,000 yard receivers he played with, and his quarterbacks made six Pro Bowls, three different quarterbacks of his made Pro Bowls. Uh, Reggie Wayne played primarily with Peyton, Andrew Luck as well. His quarterbacks made 11 Pro Bowls. He played 14 seasons. So 11 of his 14 seasons, he played with a Pro Bowl quarterback. He had six 1,000 yard rushers and 10 other 1,000 yard receivers. I mean, the, the amount of talent that these other you know, Hall of Famers we're playing with, yeah, maybe sometimes we're a little too close to it here. We know the Lions aren't that good or haven't been that good. But when you look at, you know, the, the complimentary pieces that some of these other Hall of Famers had and the things that they were able to accomplish because of the team around them, and then you look at the decrepit state of, of the franchise that Kelvin played in, it just, it, you know, I think that that speaks volumes to what he was able to accomplish um, despite his surroundings whereas others maybe, you know, that helped them accomplish, help them some of reach, reach, help them reach some of their accomplishments and goals. So you're saying it's going to be Dan Orlovsky's fault if he doesn't get in basically. Not, not Dan Orlovsky, but that's, that's a point too. I mean, look, you know, for half of Kelvin's career, he played with, I, I you know, I, I rattled this off. I think that's in the video too. The quarterbacks he played with for the first four seasons of his nine year career, John Kitna, JT O'Sullivan, Dan Orlovsky, Dante Culpepper, Drew Stanton, Drew Henson, Sean Hill. Those are Stafford too. Stafford was a rookie in 2009 and, you know, he, whatever, played parts of three games with, in 2010. But that's who he caught more passes from his first four seasons. That's half of his career. So it's not like he had Peyton Manning throwing him the ball, running his offense. It's not like he had Kurt Warner, a Hall of Famer, you know, uh, you know throwing him the ball and running his offense. So I think Kelvin's numbers, I think his case, I think it speaks for itself. Yeah, that's, that's, that's always, you know, and anybody who in Detroit obviously knows that he just didn't have that help. You know, a lot of times it felt like it was Calvin out there by himself, you know, and just throw Calvin the ball and certainly Stafford leaned on him so much, you know, I mean, he would just every time. And I think that's where Stafford kind of learned the whole, like my best option is to throw deep to Calvin and he's either going to catch it or I'm going to get a PI that's going to get me 45 yards, you know? So he loved that's that is Stafford's favorite play to this. To the, the free play is number one. And then the deep bomb that's going to he's going to beg for a P.I. That's those are Stafford's one and one a favorite plays. Um, but yeah, Calvin did. Calvin did a lot of stuff by himself, you know, and, you know, and he probably he probably would have played longer, but he just, you know, he he didn't know how to take the pedal off the gas. You know, he was always playing, you know, full out, even in practice. And um, and he probably could have could have saved himself, you know, maybe, maybe set out some games, not played as a decoy, taking some more, you know, games off here and there uh, when he was hurt, um, probably could have gotten another couple years out of it. But, you know, that was who he was. He was like, I'm going to go out every time he performed, put his body. We saw him in the locker room. You see him in the locker room walking slowly. <laughs> like I, I remember Calvin, he, 
I don't know if he ever loved football like so passionately, like he was really good at it. And I think he, it meant a lot to him, but he always wanted to be Ken Griffey. You know, that's who he wanted, Ken Griffey Jr. He wanted to be a baseball outfielder and that was his true passion. And I think football was his calling, but man, he, you just see him sometimes walk in that locker room so slow, like, man, this thing is beating the hell, but it's beating the life out of this guy. Um, and I remember talking to him about it um, one time about how he said, you know, like, man, the only thing that's saving me is massages. Like he had to get a massage every day. His body was so just a big bruise. And he said at Georgia Tech, they didn't have a masseuse. He goes, I don't know how I even got through that. Like he thinking back, you know, when you're young, you don't know that that's a normal course of recovery. Um, but he is like, you could just see he was toward the end of his career. It was like, it's, it's taken out a lot out of him. And, and he gets a lot of credit for that. Even playing hurt, playing, he would always go out doing it himself, you know, helping when he could. Um, and this team was bad and it went through a lot of coaches, um, not a lot of stability, didn't have a Tony Dungy, you know, didn't have a Dirk, Dirk Vermeil type coach, you know, um, so. We had coaches, five offensive coordinators he played with in nine seasons. So that's that, you know, that kind of, you know, turnover, I think also takes it out of players. And the fact that he kept performing at that level, um, you know, and Stafford gets credit for that because that he and Stafford ended up working pretty well together. Um, when Stafford, when they got Stafford, finally, it was, it, 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 it started clicking. Um, and yeah, but he certainly, yeah, that's a really good, it's a really good point. I mean, uh, kudos to you, Dave, you got it. Uh, kudos to me as Max Scherzer would say. No, I, you know, I, I was, it was, that was the first presentation I've had to give, you know, the way the hall of fame works. Uh, the selection committee works is that there's, there's 48 selectors and there's one that sort of represents each team. And so when a player from that team comes up for um, vote, you know, the, that elector has to give the presentation to the room. So I give it a you know, five minute or so presentation. Mine went a little bit longer, but, you know, presentation. Then you open it up for a, a discussion to everyone in the room. And then I give a little closing, um, you know, make some closing comments. And, um, you know, with Calvin, look, I just want to share one story. And I think I had mentioned this on the podcast I did with Calvin back in um, August. Um, you know, Dan Orlovsky, who was with Kelvin at the very beginning of his career and then was with him at the end of his career, he said, uh, you know, Kelvin was, you know, he was always after the quarterbacks, he was the first one in the building every day, right? So, I, you know, I don't know, you know, you're right. I mean, he, he put everything he could into this, you know, his calling of, of football. And at the end of his career, though, you know, Dan said you could sort of see, you know, had you been around for all those years and in all those mornings, you would have seen the toll that the game had taken that, you know, when he came in, right, that, that, you know, as a young guy, he was bright and peppy and big smile and, you know, uh, full of life. And, and by the end, when he got in there that last year, you know, he, he's walking in and boom, boom, you know, trudging his way into the locker room, not because he didn't want to be there, but just because that's how his body felt after, you know, nine years of punishment. And so, um, you know, I think people that were around him realize that, you know, he, he gave his body to the game and ultimately whatever feud is going on with the Lions, that's why he retired. You know, he couldn't produce at that level anymore. And I'll, I'll say this, you know, to the, the, you know, committee's credit, you know, the length of his career was not an issue, you know, yesterday it was, it was, uh, you know, a lot of the discussion, as I said, you know, centered around um, just the merits of being a first ballot hall of famer. And, you know, to me, I don't, it doesn't matter if you go in on the first or the fifth or the 10th or the 20th, or, or you go in from the, you know, the seniors committee at the end of the day, if you're a hall of famer, you're a hall of famer and you pick the best guys uh, that are up for election in that class. And, uh, you know, I've said all along, I thought Kelvin was one of those guys and we'll find out soon enough if he is. Can I ask you just, just, you know, this might get, get, get you kicked off of the committee, but um, if there was a, if, what, if you had a choice or do you think it might be wise to, switch this from a committee discussion and vote. There's a lot of politics that come into this of, you know, my guys had to wait and this guy's coming up and it's a first ballot guy versus a whatever. And then there's a senior committee, just a straight vote. I mean, kind of the way baseball does it, just let the Pro Football Writers Association members vote on this. Do you think that'd be a better way to go maybe? Um, I don't, I don't, because I think, you know, then you have too many people voting. And I, I think the discussion you know, there are, there are some very good points that get brought up. I mean, these discussions, you know, I, I don't know, I don't have a time on how long Kelvin's went, but, you know, 
look, some people, Peyton Manning, right? There's no need to discuss, right? You can go in and say, you know, the line was was Jim Brown and sit down, right? Because that's who he is, right? I mean, like, <laughs> you don't need to say anything, right? You say his name and then you're done, right? There are people that fall into that category, right? Kelvin did not fall into that category. We, ha we had a discussion, um, you know, but I, I think there are many good points that get, you know, brought up. There are many stories that get told that can be worthwhile and, um, you know, you're right that certainly there can be some politicking, but I think ultimately, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of value in sharing some of that knowledge. And, you know, I heard from people after my presentation yesterday who, who just said, you know, that was really good. Like I didn't hadn't considered that. And so um, I think it's it's good for people who aren't around that player, you know, the, the, the you know entirety of their career or maybe even, you know, when you're in another conference, you don't see that guy quite as much. Um, so I, I think it's good for. I think it's good for that discussion to take place and to uh, even though those days can be, you know, excruciatingly long, nine hours, no one wants to sit on a, a Zoom for nine hours. I think there's a lot of a lot of value in that, too. And there's there, in in your in your opinion, you think that is it pretty much a slam dunk that he's going to get in, but just not necessarily the first year. I look, I came out of that meeting meeting feeling good about Calvin's chances this year. I have no idea what's going to happen. Um, the format was a little different this year. Uh, you know, the, the top five or, the, or whoever is elected, I should say, will, will be notified, you know, in the coming weeks. So we don't have a clue, you know, who it is right now. Um, I came out feeling good about his chances this year. Um, I came out feeling 100% certain that if he doesn't get in this year, he gets in next year. I think the only thing that would hold him back would be people thinking that, um, you know, maybe other people because they've been on the ballot longer deserve to go in more. And again, for me, that's not a, that's not a consideration I take. I just, I sort of look at the, the player, their career, their body of work, you know, what they meant to the game and uh, pick the five most, most deserving of the, the 15 players that we get to vote on. And there's no, to, to your knowledge, there's no one, like obviously Larry Fitzgerald is not retired, but someone like, is there a receiver coming up next year who would be the slam dunk that might overtake Calvin? No, look, I mean, there's some good receivers on the ballot right now, you know, Torrey Holt, Reggie Wayne, they both have worthy, you know, Hall of Fame, you know, cases and, you know, Heinz Ward has never been in the final 15. And that's another guy that I think, you know, at some point will probably be discussed, you know, he's got Super Bowl rings and he, he meant a lot to that organization. Andre Johnson is on the ballot next year, Steve Smith, you know, so, so there are some, some very good receivers. I mean, we're in an era of very good receivers and, you know, certainly at some point, you know, you, you worry about, cause we've seen this happen with, offensive linemen or receivers or whoever that, that players at one position can start splitting the vote. Um, right. But, you know, my sense is just that Kelvin is sort of, you know, he's elevated himself above some others at the, the position, you know, that are waiting to get in. I think so. Fitzgerald is the only other guy I could think of who would come up, who'd be a, the slam dunk. It would be their first, no question. So if they, you know, Andre Johnson and, and Smith, like, I don't think they're, they wouldn't be that slam dunk guy who like, well, we got to get him in the first ballot, you know, like. I think you're right. Larry will you know. get in, you know, Julio Jones, when he retires, he's going to get in, you know, probably first ballot. I mean, but those guys, right. They're, they still play this year. They're still playing next year, another year, however many years, then it's five years after that. So that's still a ways down the road. And, you know, I think we'll probably have sifted through some of the, the receivers that are currently eligible or will be eligible here next year, you know, before we get to that point. So Definitely, uh, you know, the Hall of Fame is, uh, I mean, it's a, you know, it's an interesting thing to, to, to discuss and be a part of every year. I'm, I'm glad I sort of get to sit through that. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, and I've always said, you know, when you're in that room, you know, you, by and large, you deserve to be in. And it's just sort of splitting hairs as to who gets in when and, and where and why. But, um, you know, all those, all the, all the players that we talk about for the most part are, are very worthy candidates. All right, let's. Uh, you got any other Hall of Fame questions, Carlos? Before we wrap, you good? No, I mean you got you got your Stafford case. You're already making that for uh, Lions. Will extend him one more time. You said he's good to play five years from now. Um, you know, never mind that they're talking. They've already drafted Aaron Rodgers' replacement, and Rodgers is what like four years, three, four years older than Stafford. So they're already ready to move on from the guy who might take him to the Super Bowl this year. Stafford hasn't won anything, but he has five more years left in them coming off bad backs and, and ribs and thumbs and whatever else, you know, um, but he's got five years left. Right. So he does. five years uh -huh. from then, that's 10 years from now. You got Stafford's vote coming up. 
unless Stafford just wants to play to a round number of 15 and be done. Um, yeah. I think Stafford could keep playing for, you know, look, I mean, he, uh, right. You look at a Drew Brees, a Phillip Rivers, their arms aren't there anymore, Carly, right. You watch them play like they're shot, their bodies are shot. And Stafford has, his body has been through a lot, but the, the skills are still there. So I think as long as the skills are still there, you know, he, he still has that in him. And so absolutely, I do expect him to play another, or I do think he can play another five to seven years if, if that's what his heart desires, you know, and uh, yeah. I'm not saying it's all going to be for Detroit. Cause as I've said, I, you know, the injuries to me, if I'm running the organization, you know, that, that has to be a little bit of a concern and, and where you are, where the organization is the state that you are in of competitiveness versus when you will be, you know, a, a Super Bowl contender versus, you know, his contract, his age, all that stuff. That, that to me is the biggest thing. I mean, I don't want to go back into the Stafford thing, but that to me, as I've said, is why Stafford's future in Detroit has been a question. It's not about Stafford's skills. It's not about him as a player, right? It, it's about all those other things around him. So, um, but. Well, well, one quick question. Do you think, yeah. do you think that these guys are new in their job? And this is part of the reason why I wanted Colbert or Schneider, you know, is do you think that, you know, Brad Holmes and Dan Campbell are going to get carte blanche from Sheila Hamp? to get rid of Stafford? Are they going to want to have that on their resume of I'm the guy who got rid of Matthew Stafford and then saw him go to the Colts and win two playoff games and get him to the AFC championship? You know, do you well, think I'll tell you what, I, I think most people across the league, I believe would come into this position and want to keep Matthew Stafford. So Brad Holmes, Dan Campbell, if that is in fact how they feel, I don't think they'd be alone. In fact, I think the vast majority of people would be with him in wanting to keep him, you know, in the short term. Now, I also think that if both those guys have a long enough vision here, they're both young guys and they look at, you know, my success that I can have in Detroit, um, they have to see the end of Stafford's career in that their tenure, right? Like if, if I see myself as being the, the coach of the Lions for the next 10 years, that's probably going to include a, a quarterback other than Stafford. And same thing as GM. I know I'm going to have to draft Stafford's replacement at some time. So I do think that they, they both um, can believe they can win with Stafford now, know they will have to replace Stafford in the future, can be comfortable doing that. It's just a matter of if you do it at, you know, 34 years old next year, 33 years old, you know, you draft somebody this year or, you sign him to another contract. That's the the bigger decision as to when that comes. And ultimately, you know, um, that's why I say it's something that I, I think the organization needs to figure out in terms of finding a replacement sooner rather than later. But Carlos, look, if they don't, if they don't take a quarterback right in the first round this year, like they're probably in the same situation next year, maybe even worse because then Stafford would be entering his last year and you have to do a deal. And maybe you have to back yourself into that corner of picking a, a quarterback and maybe you don't have a top seven pick. Maybe you're picking 15th or something. So you don't have as good of a, you know, a, a choice of, of quarterbacks. And, and so that's why I say from the Lions standpoint, you never want to be backed into a corner for any team. You never want to be backed into a corner of having to pick a quarterback. Like we absolutely need a quarterback. I want to take Christian Ponder, right? I used that example before, right? No, that's why the Vikings stunk because you, you, you forced a pick that didn't belong. And so teams like the Packers, uh, teams like the Kansas City Chiefs, teams like, you know, the, the Patriots tried to do, right? When they find a quarterback that they believe in and take him for the right reasons, even when they don't need him, I think that's the recipe for success in the NFL. So you're saying they have to they they have to take a quarterback this year then they, that that decision has to be this year. I think if that guy is there, right? Like if they think Zach Wilson is going to be a really good quarterback and he's there at seven, and you're like, you know what? Like, uh, you know, Micah Parsons can help me a lot more, and I know I want this guy, and we're going to contend this year. And Brad Holmes said that yesterday, right? He said we were going to put the best team out there possible. And so one of the TV places, I think he did say too that he, you know, that that top pick in the draft, he wants a contributor. But to me, if you see that quarterback, right, and you think that quarterback can be the guy, maybe not this year or next year, but two years down the road, whatever, he can be your quarterback for the next 10 years, you take him, no matter who else is on the board. You have to solve that position, the long-term future of that position first. And that's what I would like to see from, and now look, you know, some of these guys are, are never truthful enough to know what they thought of that quarterback, you know, like in why they passed on him or why they took him or why they didn't. But that's what the organization has to figure out which quarterback 
can be our long-term solution at the position beyond Trevor Lawrence, because he's not going to be there, right? Which of those other guys that's there, can I win with long-term? If you think one of those guys is there, do you take him at seven? If you have doubts, if you don't think any of those guys is, then I have no problem passing on them. But I just think you have to, you know, you really have to think long and hard about taking a quarterback at number seven, even with Stafford coming back for however long. I think that, I mean, you wrote that article today about saying you thought that what Holmes said about Stafford indicated that he wants to hold on to him. Um, you know, I, I didn't quite see it that way. I thought he was being very politic, saying he's a good player, but we're going to wait to see what the coach wants. And it has to work kind of holistically and the vision for the whole draft. We have to value all the players, you know, but he's a very good player, um, you know, kind of putting his, you know, his uh, the for sale sign on the car, the used car, you know, mini condition, whatever, 1978 Pinto. Um, so, you know, that I understand it was, I thought he was being more politic, but I'm concerned that Dan Campbell has enough contacts from his days playing with the Lions, you know, guys like Riola, maybe guys like Orlovsky, I don't know who he was buddies with necessarily, but those guys are going to talk up Stafford. And, you know, he didn't play with Stafford, but if he has enough contacts, oh man, Stafford's the best, Stafford's the best. Of course, your buddy Dan Orlovsky wants Stafford to get traded. So maybe that, maybe he'll, I don't know, say something else to Dan, but um, yeah, that's, it's, if it wasn't, it's kind of weird. Like if he wasn't a former lion, it, it, he may have a completely different, you know, point of view here, but if he knows just enough people, the holdovers from the organization, you know, guys he used to play with who play with, with Stafford and thought highly of them. And they're both kind of the, you know, tough, football player kind of guy you know like I don't know maybe there'll be too simpatico maybe there'll be too much of a connection between Campbell and Stafford and like well you know like let's just keep rolling with this guy let's let's hold on to him and see how he does this year and extend him next year and if not then Brad Holmes you work your magic and go get Eric Jared Goff somehow and you know next year's another year uh it's very complicated, but I think the, the Campbell former Lions connection complicates things. The um, look, Dan Campbell in Miami, uh, you know, he saw what not having a quarterback, you know, how, how tough that was to overcome. And in New Orleans, he saw what having a quarterback, you know, and Drew Brees is a Hall of Famer, right? I'm not saying Stafford's the same thing, but but what not having a quarterback, how tough it is, and what having a quarterback, what you can do. Same thing in, in LA with, with the Rams, right? Brad Holmes saw that you know, they didn't have a quarterback under Jeff Fisher. I mean, for all those years. Right. And, and they did when, and he got to the Rams after some of that very early success, you know, and, and then they went out and took a Jared Goff and Jared Goff, I, you know, Stafford's a better quarterback than Jared Goff in my eyes, but you know, they, they at least were, were serviceable above serviceable at the quarterback position when they made that pick and then they got to the Super Bowl. So I also think both these guys have, have seen, how important that position is, how hard it is to get that position right. And so, you know, I've always said, and I, I fully admit this and acknowledge this, it's much easier for us on this side to say, trade Stafford, you know, our jobs don't depend on it. You know, our, you know, we, but, I, you know, I, 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 so I always try to put myself in their shoes as to why or when they would do that. And I, I think just, again, from talking to people across the league you know, people around the people that were involved in some of these searches, I think the vast majority of the NFL, um, not saying they would rule with Stafford, you know, till he's 40, but I do think the vast majority would go into this season planning on Matthew Stafford being their quarterback and then solving that quarterback position long-term as they go on, whether it's this year, next, however far in the future, knowing they need to, to, to come up with a solution, but, um, you know, operating as if Matthew Stafford will be the quarterback in 2021. Well, the, the last thing I would say about that is just, you know, like that's why I wish that they just say it's a rebuild, you know, because they have drop five draft picks. And if you need to, if, if you really feel like you need to, you know, you, you, you like the quarterback who's there at seven um, and you, you draft him, he doesn't have to play this year. He could play next year or even the year after that, you know, but that's a two, three year plan to have a young quarterback. Um, who doesn't have to play and, and what you're going to do with Stafford, you know, you don't have to solve it all this year. And I think if you're holding on to Stafford, part of that is you're trying to win this year. You're trying to solve it this year, you know, and trading back and getting more picks and this and that, and we're going to bolster the rock, you know, like I understand you want to put the best team out there and you want to be competitive. That's fine. But if you really have a true vision, you're not going to, it's not going to get done in one year with this team. You know, you're going to need two, probably three years 
And so that's why the quarterback, I hope that he, I hope that they have the, the okay from Sheila to say, if you need to draft a quarterback, go ahead. Don't worry about what Stafford thinks about it. If you need to train them to get more picks or whatever, but you can still, you can, you, you know, and you have to draft a quarterback, that's fine too. You know, like don't let the Stafford emotional thing or, or political thing impede you have your vision, what you want to do, what you like about your draft board, the top guys who are available and pursue them if you need to. Now, if the quarterback, if they don't like, that's, we never know, right? If they don't like a quarterback, they never tell us, well, we didn't like any of those guys. They all sucked. Um, but if they didn't like them, then, you know, then it's understandable. Um, but it's always, you know, unfortunately, the NFL, I think it's more about keeping your job than doing your job in the highest orders of the administration. So they tend to be conservative that way. Um, but it'll be fascinating to hear what, what Dan Campbell says about Stafford and what their plan is. Listen, Brad Holmes, Dan Campbell, you both have my number. I've texted you both. You didn't get back to me. You're forgiven for that. I know that I'll text you plenty more times and you won't get back to me, but you both have my number. So at some point here in March, April, excuse me, at some point here in March or April, call me, let me know. Just say, hey, listen, I won't, you can tell me, right? This is off the record just for your background, not to use it all. This is how I feel about the quarterbacks. If this quarterback is there, I think he's going to be a star. I would take him. Anyone else, we're not taking them. That way, when we're doing this discussion a couple of years from now and we're talking about whether Stafford needs a new contract or how to go about it, I can say, you know what? Look, the Lions really didn't believe in quarterback X, and this is why they decided to – and had quarterback Y been there, they would have taken them. So that way we can put it all on the record when the time comes to, to, uh, to assess that. So I don't have Dan Campbell's number, but I think I have his agent's number. I think I can get that for you, Dave. Yeah, I'm not sorry. Like I said, I, I texted Dan, so we're all we're all good. So okay, all uh, good. But uh, you know, if his agent, you know, uh, he certainly knows my number too. So if he wants to let me know what Dan thinks about that before the draft, um, I'll keep it. Again, I can keep it. I can keep it uh, confidential <laughs> until the, uh, the time comes. So, all right, we'll leave it there. Um, that'll do it for Carlos Menares. I'm Dave Burkett. Good discussion today. Dan Campbell, Brad Holmes, you know, Kelvin Johnson, Matthew Stafford, everything. A lot going on in Lions world. And uh, look, the regime is in. Everything is done. And uh, after I write a, a nice big story for Sunday, I think it's time for me to take a break. So uh, I don't know when we'll see you next. I'm sure we'll see you before long. But uh, for Carlos Menares, I'm Dave Burkett, Freep.com.